Well, welcome Jonathan and Peter to launch this new piece of work. Thank you very much, Davey, for that introduction. So uh, I'm Peter Sims. Uh, I'm just going to take you through a bit of a tour of this report. We have paper copies at the back. So if you haven't already picked one up, there's paper copies at the back. It's also available to download online. Um, uh, there's a, the web links and all the details are on the back of the report. Um, so rethinking demand for energy. So this is rethinking demand in general, but this report specifically focuses on energy in the sense of uh, energy that we use day to day, not energy embedded in, in, in products, but energy that we use on a day to day basis, direct energy consumption. So um, this report has three authors, myself and Jonathan, and also Nadine, who presented at the online event in Brussels, but isn't here in Ireland today. Um, uh, I'm just going to give you a little overview of the, the project methodology and how we came to produce this report, uh, and then we're going to take you on a little tour of some of the key findings and the, the key points within it. Um, and hopefully this will stimulate some interesting, interesting reflections from you, interesting questions, and we can uh, have a bit of a discussion around. Uh, so, as I said, this is a focus on direct energy demand, not wider resource use. We, you know, uh, we we had to limit the scope because it's, you know, it's there's a huge amount to engage with here, um, and we thought uh, it was really interesting to just focus on energy for now. Um, we've interviewed over the course of this project 30 leading academics and political. Um, you know, elected Greens and uh, candidates and various other people, and we've got a range of different views that fed into this, this um, piece of work. That led to us holding two roundtable discussions. The report is published today, um, and the foreword by, for this report is by Philip Lambert, who's an MEP in the Green European, in the European Parliament. Um, so that's sort of an overview of how this report came to be. Um, I think it's important to give a bit of context about what we mean by rethinking demand for energy. So. We're talking here about deliberately reducing the demand for energy. Uh, and we're talking about, therefore, changing the demand for energy services, not just changing how they're provided. So this isn't about you know, swapping one technology for another in order to deliver the same energy service. This is about rethinking how much energy, you know, what energy services we actually, actually matter to us, how important they are, what, you know, what we want to prioritize and what we actually need and what benefits our well-being. Um, and doing that requires yeah, engaging with two pieces of academic research that we've done through part of this. One of them's uh, called um, social practice theory, but it's basically about daily practices. It's around you know the way businesses and individuals go about their lives day to day. And the other one's about systems of provision. So this is the things that determine you know the things beyond our own control that determine what demand there is. So this is things like infrastructure, the layout of our public spaces, you know, what's available in terms of shops and services, um, the relative pricing of different things. All of these things come together to influence and, and shape what decisions we make about demand and what decisions companies make about demand. Um, so this is what we mean by rethinking demand for energy. We're going beyond just nudge and behavior change and uh, just tweaking, uh, you know, swapping one technology for another, which Jonathan's gonna come on to a bit later. So is rethinking demand is necessary. So uh, we, one of the things that we did as part of the research in this is we interviewed people from the University of Cambridge and they've recently published a report called Absolute Zero. Uh, and this report makes clear that um, you know, there is only a limited amount of renewable energy, sustainable energy available. You know, there is a limit to how fast you can build renewable energy. There's a limit to how much land we have. Um, there's a limit uh, around the resources and material stuff, which I'm sure will get picked up later in terms of the circular economy. Um, so we ultimately have a choice. We either uh, reduce demand for energy or we overshoot our carbon budget and risk going beyond 1.5 degrees. So and the consequences that come. With that. So and I think it's important to frame uh, you know, the situation we're in as a choice. It's not a fate of complete. You know, if we do nothing effectively, business as usual, the status quo will continue. We have to, if we want to change direction, if we want to uh, limit climate change, we have to, we think, we pros and misfraud, actively choose to rethink demand for energy. And this is a, a collective choice our society must make. And I think in a lot of senses, it's a choice that we haven't necessarily made yet. Um, so we, this almost means we have a choice between the status quo and disruption because rapid change to our ways of da our daily practices, to our, the, the ways of business operating, business practices, all of this will, um, it will be disruptive in the short term. It has, you know, by definition, change is disruptive. Um, so we have to make that choice. 
And we also feel, and this is the one of the things we touch on in this report, is it's also a choice between redistribution. Um, it's a choice for redistribution, because if we don't choose to redistribute the limited amount of energy that we will then have, uh, we don't think, we think the inequality will become unacceptable. And certainly the inequality that we've already got will be baked in further. But you know, to get the political mandate, to get the public mandate and the public support for this sort of disruptive change, there has to be redistributive in nature. Um, so that's one of the points that we explore more in the report. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Jonathan now, who's perhaps gonna pick up a few more bits on this, and then he's gonna take you through some of the, the, the governance section of the report, and then the policy section of the report, and then I'm gonna come back at the end with narrative. So over to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I just want to touch on two things. Firstly, how we need to change the governance and that, then how we need to change the policies that respond to that and, and, and why in that order. Well, we started this research thinking it was the policies that needed to change, but increasingly we found that it's the wider governance that blocks the policy change that's needed. We, we found that many places that have declared a climate emergency, but it's not just about declaring it, it's about then transforming the action completely that follows. There's an opportunity now to address the cost of living crisis through redistribution of energy uh, resources in ways that frame and direct that emergency response to the climate science. We need to take that on now. It's a challenge for emergency governance changes now, not at some point in the future to be planned for. Well, and, and what would that look like? What would a change of governance look like that eliminated fossil fuel use globally? Um, how do we avoid those global oil companies and others uh, corrupting the roles of governments that, that, are, that need to enact the policies that we need to limit the demand for energy in the first place, as well as phasing out fossil fuel supply. And unless we do that, the chances are that renewable energy that we install will be in addition to, rather than instead of, the fossil fuel use we currently use globally. There's a strong motivation now, as we know, for a drastic reduction in demand um, that reduces our reliance on imports of Russian oil and gas, not just here, uh, not just across Europe, but across the world. And, and that really should mean that now is as important time as ever to radically rethink how much energy we use as a better way to improve energy security than securing energy security and somehow uh, in terms of reliance on, on imports from elsewhere. We need to deal with the cost of living and the energy crisis together. Um, that means we need to deal with excessive consumption alongside fuel poverty, isolation alongside hypermobility, jet-setting lifestyles. But, but how do we do that? What, well, firstly, what came through on the interviews is we need to address um, the vested interests, the fossil fuel companies uh, that sit behind the current government system and hold hostage our governments to their demands. We need to change that so that we have transparency that's essential for building trust, for politicians to be able to make the right decisions in all of our interests. So let's, let's, let's just step back from it and, and really accept that that is where politics is now. It's holding back the scale and the speed of change that's needed. We've got greenwash. Greenwash, I, I used to think was something that was the, uh, the, the hold of, of BP or, or Shell Oil Company claiming to have the future uh, all um, cleverly wrapped up in their advertising campaigns. But increasingly, it's also a tool of government that's papering over the cracks, uh, the chasms, if you like, between the talk and the action. And I'll just give you one example from the UK, uh, as, as that's what, what I, I know best. Uh, the, the UK government has just passed a new aviation policy. It's called Jet Zero. Now, I imagine it maybe started as a ministerial joke of someone who likes to um, sit on, have I got news for you? Um, because it rhymes with net zero. Uh, but what it does is allow the aviation industry to have plans to expand every single airport in the UK and expand uh, the, the scale, the distance of freight and passengers around the world, uh, driving airport expansion there as well as here, um, at the time when we should be acting on climate change with the promise that somehow the, some technical solutions will fly in or some biofuels will be grown elsewhere around the world to somehow buy us out of trouble later. And, and then we have this mythical idea of hydrogen and, uh, and electric planes, which really only will work on the short haul, which at best will cover something like three or 4% of the emissions of flight. So there's a growing integrity gap that's papered over. It needs to be addressed. We need an honesty. And that means we also need to move away from a financial 
focus of, of politics to, to have such as a Ministry of Investment, which was suggested to us as a way to oversee and deliberate and arbitrate between government departments on climate grounds. We need to establish the state of emergency more like that we had within in, in the COVID uh, pandemic that allows us to act and react quickly. We need to develop a real mandate to sustain that over a period of time, such as through direct, direct democracy and real empowerment at the citizen level. Because I think we really need to localize government and bring government such that it's held by and held to account by individual people. Next, I think on the side, we're talking about this idea of disruption. I think that's really, really important. We need to accept that rethinking energy demand means changing the status quo, um, not blindly hoping that renewable energy will some, somehow power a continuation of our current lifestyles, our current scale of energy and material use. Uh, that's what the size of the economy is all about. That simply is not possible. We need to drastically reduce the scale of our material and energy use to deal with the climate and connected biodiversity emergencies. That requires change, and that means that the future is going to be different. Disruption will be inherent, inherent um, but we can work through that, through things like a just transition to provide the security and the, and, and the new jobs we need across all the different sectors. We need to share the burdens, but it will mean that some businesses will decline, they'll need to shift, they'll need to pivot, and they've got currently their hands on our governments, and we need to, we need to address that. But crucially, disruption shouldn't just be about helping people through jobs. It should be about helping the most vulnerable to, to be supported through that change. Those with the greatest need, those in fuel poverty. And if we don't do that, it won't be a, just a failure of justice. It simply won't work. Just think of what happened to Macron when he proposed changes in um, fuel prices in France without any measures to address the inequality. The yellow vests came out. We need to take everyone with us. And that means we need to have a change of our current lifestyles. We need to plan support across our economy. We may need governments to intervene in a planned approach to universal basic incomes, but really extending that to universal basic services that extend far beyond the NHS into transport, into energy, into other areas. That's the kind of future we, we, really, we really need. Um, and what does that mean? That means what really we need to think about changes, not just in terms of individual sectors in transport, in energy and health and so on, but also across the whole economy. We need to shift from growth being the focus of our economy to post growth being our accepted reality of where economics is. And that means we need to change the metrics, the objectives of our economy. And, and what happens if we move from a growthist approach to an acceptance that we are beyond that growth stage in in the, the history of humanity. It means that to address the growing inequalities of today, we need to redistribute through the economics that we have. So a post-growth economics, we would argue, and it's come out so strongly in our interviews, I can't emphasize them up this, this enough. A post-growth economics is an economics of redistribution. And yeah, and, and that means we, we really need to overhaul our systems of governance. Everything needs to change. It isn't a question of somehow delivering on the climate emergency, reducing our scale of energy use by having a set of individual policies within our current governance systems. It won't work. We need to declare a state of emergency. We need to involve people far more actively participating, deliberating, holding our politicians to account, understanding and evaluating what works and really making sure we, we continue to evolve and adapt our politics going forward. So what do those policies mean? So this slide comes directly out of uh, this year's IPCC uh, climate mitigation report. Chapter five, which is about changing demands within society, focuses on avoid, shift, improve as a policy framework to, to reduce the scale of energy use to address climate change across our society. Um, so, so, so avoid, shift, improve, well, it, it's about, it's like the energy equivalent of reduce, reuse, recycle, if you like. We need to avoid the need for energy in the first place before we shift to more efficient production and, and sorry, more efficient consumption. So that will be things like um, public transport. It'll be about shared services rather than individual consumption. So there's a cultural change. There's a huge cultural change in the shift. And then improve is, is about um, using technologies to deal with what's left. 
It's about renewable energy supply. It might be electric vehicles. But the status quo is very much focused on the improved stage. It's all about electric vehicles, solar panels and wind turbines. That's what we hear from our politicians. We don't so much hear about the need for the cultural shift. We don't so much hear about the need to stop uh, our dash for growth, our dash for ever more infrastructure and resource use in the first place. So let me elaborate slightly more, more on that. So avoiding energy use um, will, mean, will mean things like, um, th things like you know, banning private jets. It'll mean um, stopping airport expansion. It'll also mean reducing the amount of energy use in, in the home. Um, and what, one thing that struck me from, from the conversation with, with a leading sociologist is, you know, 18 to 21 degrees, the average temperature in, 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 in a house. Why is that? That's because that's the, the uh, des design temperature for comfort based on a, a male wearing a suit all year round indoors. Um, sometimes people wear less in the summer. Sometimes people wear more in the winter. And there's a much more diversity of people than, than that research suggests. But, but that is locked into building regulations that's been promulgated around the world. We need to address that demand. We need to challenge some of those embedded rules that get locked into what we think of as acceptable and, and, and normal. Um, shifting, I mean, I think the big shifts are, are things like public transport. It, it, it's about retrofitting all, all of our buildings. It's the cultural shift that you don't see in, in the energy security strategies of the UK, which solely focuses on, on, on energy supply. And what's the benefits also of this avoid and shift? Before improve, it means we can do it faster. Avoid and shift to things. It's far quicker to change culture, believe it or not, than it is to build a wind turbine. And if you do those two first at scale and at speed, then the amount of renewable energy, the amount of technology investment, the amount of lithium and cobalt to be mined to go into batteries is one huge amount less. Um, let me move on. We need to join up policies. We need to think of packages of policies rather than individual policies. We need to bring together the, the enforcement sticks with the, the carrots of incentives at an at a economic level, but we also need to link together supply and demand. So for example, in, in the food sector, yes, we need to move away from an industrial agriculture at the consumption end, which can be about incentivizing uh, shifts in terms of what we buy. But at the same time, we need a just transition of agriculture to support it. We need to join up the supply with the demand. Um, and we'll find that in all of these policy areas that there's a spectrum of policies you can have from the fairly soft uh, nudges all the way through to uh, progressive pricing and then rationing and then outright bans. What's acceptable at any moment in time in any sector is going to be different in any place. But what we found in our, our research was that participation, involvement of people in decision making will, will shift the bar as to what's acceptable in any one of those areas. So if we want rapid change, if we want transformational change, we need to bring people with us and we need to involve them actively in the decision making pro, pro, process. Now, I think that's, that's absolutely crucial. I, I think finally what I like to say is, and I think it's really to emphasize a point that Peter made earlier on, is that involvement in participation is also about not just involving people to increase what's possible, but it's also to better inform government of the impacts of policies that's having and the need for these policies to be redistributive. I mean, universal basic services, shared public transport, that, that's gonna require public sector investment and public leadership and stronger regulations to direct where we want private sector to go. Um, that's a really big ask uh, for policymakers of today. And that's why I think it, it is that transformation of governance, that participatory approach, that's moving the moving away of vested interests that I think is gonna be the, the really big thing that we need to unblock to allow this kind of thing to happen. Back over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Now, there's a lot to digest there. There's a lot of different things in terms of, you know, this, re this report tries to capture a br very broad range of different angles on rethinking demand for energy and, you know, give an overview to frame the whole debate. Um, so, uh, you know, Jonathan's to look, talked about the governance challenge, the challenge that our current governance systems aren't up to scratch. And he's talked about um, 
the the you know what the policies look like and what the interventions might look like and how they might need to fit together. Um, I'm now going to talk very briefly to wrap up about um, how we talk about this. What are the narratives? What's the role of narratives? What's the role of communication? How do we you know you know take this message forward? Um, and I think to start that we need to step back a bit. We need to not go. So therefore, I need to you know work out what the the sound bite is to communicate this. We've got to step back a little bit because. Actually, if we're talking about changing culture, we've got to look at what influences culture as a whole. It's not just about you know, what we message from our organization or any other organization or political party or otherwise. Um, what influences culture, what influences values, what influences the way we people understand the world is a huge range of things from advertising to, to you know, even the layout of, uh, you know, of, of um, the way services are provided has all sorts of influences on how people understand the world and how people process things. So, Rather than looking at narratives from the, this specific narrative here, we have to look at the, the narratives overall that are portrayed and per permeated and propagated by society. And, you know, that might mean think restricting certain vested interests and um, incumbent industries' ability to influence cultural narratives through things like advertising, as well as uh, making space for alternative narratives and, and crafting alternative narratives. Um, so... I think the other it's also important to recognize the limitations of messaging. You know, we if you think in terms of you know COVID and you know a lot of governments had you know uh, public information campaigns, which is often what people think about in terms of well, how can we get communicate all this rethinking to our messaging? Well, maybe we need public information campaigns. But there's a real limit to what you can do with public information campaigns. And there was some re there's some academic research about that that's um, referenced in the report to do with too often um public information or any sort of top-down one-way messaging focuses on the what, the instructions, and glosses over the why. It's much harder to, to build understanding and comprehension around the why we need to do things and why is rethinking demand important and what are the, the dynamics of that choice we have to make through one-way messaging. And this, again, comes back to that point that this has to be a collective choice. You know, even if not everyone can be involved in every part of it, there has to, we have to build a sense of agency. We have to build a sense of control, a sense of people, um, you know, have some agency to shape what this looks like, and that we all have some degree be part of a collective choice. And that requires looking at these deliberative forms of democracy. So why matters not just what, um, and we also have to stop this tendency to sort of, well, because we've got to get it through in a one-way soundbite, we've got to simplify all of this complexity of you know thirty-six page report down to you know. Uh, Two sentence soundbite. And unfortunately, we, you know, that just obscures it. It means that we will never really get to grips with the, the real debate that needs to happen. So we have to trust people with the reality and the complexity. And we have to, uh, you know, not shy away from having those difficult conversations. Um, so there's a role for deliberation. Uh, so, um, the report, as well as having that sort of general conversation about what the role of narratives is, it also, um, you know, it does say, so, you know, here are some things where we need to build consistent narratives. So we need to have a consistent narrative that what we're aiming for is perhaps well-being for all, you know, energy security for all. It's not economic growth. That might be a means. It might not be a means. The economy is a tool. It's not a, a destination in its own right. We maybe need to have consistent messages about what humanity's place in the world, you know, that we are interdependent with other life on earth, with uh, eat planetary systems and, and that we have an intergenerational dependency as well um, and we have to convey and reinforce values like empathy and honesty and we you know we if we're going to take that redistributive approach Jonathan uh, mentioned we need to you know proactively be thinking about well what's the impact of xyz intervention on this community and that community and therefore how can we mitigate against that how can we you know build into the proposals ways of compensating ways of both you know redistribution isn't just economic it's also for instance um universal basic energy allowances to sure if energy prices go up everyone can afford their basic energy needs things like this um so narratives need to be differentiated as well as them being need to be consistency in some areas they also need to be differentiated in some sense they need to be sensitive to different cultural areas and different geographic areas and they need to evolve with time there's no you know here's the five narratives that are going to communicate all of this to every audience in Europe. That just doesn't exist. We don't, you know, we, we have to accept that there's a degree of complexity there and work with that. Um, so I'm going to end with this quote from the report. Uh, there's no time left. We need a metamorphosis, not a transition or a transformation. We need to change everything. 
And I think that brings to mind a number of key points. And the, the one that stands out for me is this idea that we can't possibly know what the end result's going to look like, what the, not the destination we're going for until we've started. The, the change that we're is going to be required in order to think rethink energy demand. You know, if we're going to make that choice to rethink energy demand and limit global temperature rise rather than pursue the status quo, we're going to have to have a leap of faith almost. We're going to have to make some decisions and head in a certain direction. And we won't know exactly what the, the society we're going to create is going to look like until we've got there. Um, and we just have to accept that. Um, and we have to, you know, perhaps talk about that too. So um, thank you very much, David. I will hand back to you.